For most people, the thick fog that enveloped part of the United Kingdom in early March of 1902 was a matter of inconvenience. It covered the Irish Channel, Holyhead, Southampton, and London. In London, people found that by traveling by any sort of vehicle was impossible, and they could only fumble their way home on foot. For ships in the harbors, it meant delays, passengers stuck in ports, and mail not getting delivered. The situation was more serious for the ships who had already left port. At least one ship grounded near Holyhead, and her passengers were forced to go on shore in boats. But worse news was yet to come. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story, The Vasland is Struck in the Fog? Here we are. Enjoy! The Vosland had left Liverpool in spite of the thick fog, but she was hardly able to creep along. The Vosland, in 1902, was a part of the Red Star Line, but she had not started her life under the name Vosland, or as part of the American Line's fleet. Originally named the Russia, she had been the first major propeller-driven ship of the Cunard Line when she had been built in 1867. The Cunard Line had tried a propeller ship before in the form of the China in 1862, but she was not warmly received, and a return had been made to paddle-wheeled ships for a few years before the Russia was launched. The Russia met with much greater success than the China did. With her iron hull and 13-knot speed, the Russia could be considered one of the modern new ships that were starting to appear in the passenger liner trade. The Vossland was still one of the faster ships in the Atlantic crossing in 1881, when the Red Star Line, a line based in Antwerp, purchased her. Under the Cunard Line, the Russia had been a first-class-only ship, the staterooms for only 430 passengers. The Red Star Line gave their new ship heavy renovations. She was lengthened, her engines were modernized, and since the Red Star Line specialized in bringing immigrants from Europe to America, the accommodations were changed so that she could hold 120 first-class passengers and 1,500 third-class passengers. This was also before the era where steam was considered entirely reliable as a means of transportation, and so they added an additional mast, taking her from her original three masts to four. With these renovations came a new name. She was henceforth the Vossland. Between her life as the Russia and her subsequent life as the Vossland, as 1900 drew near, the Vossland was an incredibly well-traveled ship, but she was about to get a new route. In 1895, the Vossland was chartered by the American line to travel from Philadelphia to Liverpool. At about one in the afternoon on the 5th of March, 1902, the Vossland departed Liverpool on her regular route to Philadelphia. She was far from full of passengers, having on board 32 first-class passengers and 82 steerage passengers, but she did have a large miscellaneous cargo, as well as 89 people as her crew. Due to the fog, it was slow going, though, and by 11.30 that night, the Vossland was only off Anglesey, behind schedule, but on her way. Captain Apfeld and his crew were all apprehensive of the lack of visibility. It was later said that she was only going fast enough to keep her headway. One officer would later describe the events that followed to the New York Times. Most of the passengers had gone to sleep already, considering the late hour he had enough concerns about the weather that before retiring himself, he took one last walk around deck. He was trying to look over the side of the ship when there was a crash and the entire ship shuddered and caused him to stagger. He looked up to see that the bow of another ship was embedded near the bow of the Vossland. 
He would later say that it looked as though the bow of the other ship had taken a bite out of them. The other ship would prove to be the Harmonides. A British steamer, the Harmonides, was returning to her home port of Liverpool from Argentina. Both the Harmonides and the Vossland were traveling slowly and blowing their whistles, but the Harmonides was later found to have failed in one precaution. It would later be found that she had failed to stop until she discovered where the Vossland was in the fog after hearing the Vossland's fog signals. It was a decision with a predictable end. The Harmonides backed away from the Vossland, but then accidentally struck her again, creating even more damage. Immediately, the engine room of the Vossland began to fill with water at a rate that made it very clear that she could not be saved. They were going to have to evacuate. In spite of this, the crew of the Vossland stayed at their posts until they were given the order to come up to the deck and take their place on one of the last boats to leave the sinking ship. One of the crew, the man with the closest call, was the purser, however, who had been sleeping in his cabin at the bow of the ship when one of the broken iron hull plates of the Harmonides crashed into his room, narrowly missing his head. The Harmonides, meanwhile, stood by, ready to offer any assistance that was needed. A commercial traveler named Southwell, who was traveling as a passenger on the Vossland, would tell the newspapers that when the collision first occurred, he was getting ready for bed and was almost completely undressed when the ship had shuddered. Far from understanding the danger they were in, he had assumed that the ship's engines had just suddenly backed and everything was fine. It was not until a ship's steward rushed into his room and breathlessly told him to come to the deck and leave everything behind that he understood what had actually happened. Only putting on enough clothing to preserve his dignity, he joined the rest of the crowd rushing to the deck. Another passenger said that he had slept through the collision and had not realized anything had happened until one of the stewards woke him. All through the ship, the stewards ran raising the alarm and telling everyone to abandon everything and be ready to evacuate. For most of the passengers, most of whom had been asleep moments before, they rushed to the deck without jackets, hats, and shoes. Their urgency proved to be warranted. The Vossland was settling quickly. A majority of the passengers were Swedish immigrants who were traveling as families. This meant that the officers of the ship reserved the first lifeboat for women and children on board. The conduct of the passengers would later be praised. There had been a few screams when people had realized they were on a sinking ship and some concern voiced, but as a whole, the passengers had been calm and orderly as they were loaded into the lifeboats. The passengers, in turn, had nothing but praise for Captain Opfeld and his crew, who they credited with keeping entirely calm the entire time, which, in turn, helped them feel as though there was no danger. A Mr. Ferguson, a first-class passenger, would later say that the largest panic in the passengers was expressed in a rush for the lifebelts. This mainly proved to be ineffective, since many of the passengers did not know how to wear them, and they put them on upside down, meaning that if they did end up in the water, they would quickly be feet up. He saw at least one passenger, who had decided to attach seven lifebelts to various parts of his body. One first-class passenger was witnessed running around the deck in a panic, but his actions seemed to have been an exception and the other passengers seemed to have mostly chosen to ignore him. The Vossland had ten boats in total, and since she was not at full passenger capacity, eight proved to be sufficient for everyone on board. The crew was also well drilled in the launching of the lifeboat, and acted in such a methodical manner to get all of the passengers on board the lifeboats, that it was later held up as an example of why all ships should ensure they did similar drills often. As the boats launched, they were quickly rowed away from the ship to ensure they were not dragged down with the ship when she sank. 
in the darkness and the fog, the boats were quickly separated, and though the Harmonides was nearby for some of the boats, she did not prove that easy to find. The evacuation of the Vossland was not without incident. One passenger, a man named Edward Dangerfield, frantic to get on board one of the first boats to launch, leapt from the deck to the boat as it was being lowered. His action caused the boat to rock, and he lost his footing, smashing his head against the boat and fell into it never to rise again. Eleanor Emmett, the eleven-year-old daughter of a clergyman, fell into the water when Dangerfield jumped into the boat, and no one was able to pull her to safety. A few weeks later, she would wash to shore, and after a short inquest, she was buried in a funeral that drew sympathy for her family from across the country. The inquest did add a congratulations to both Captain Apfeld of the Vosland and Captain Penton of the Harmonides for remaining cool and calm and doing everything they could to save lives. A passenger on the seventh lifeboat to be launched admitted that once they had rowed away from the ship, they had become completely lost. They tried shouting, but heard nothing in response. Finally, they spotted flickering lights, which they rowed towards, only to realize that they were drawing close to the stern of a sinking ship. They had somehow managed to circle back to the Vossland, meaning that they were the only people to see her final moments. All of the sudden, before the fog hid her again, the Vossland gave a huge lurch to port, and then the water covered her. As she went down, the water reached her boilers, and there was a deafening explosion that blew water into the air, leaving no one with any doubts as to the fate of the ship. In total, it had taken her around 40 minutes to sink, and in spite of the disorienting fog and most of the people on board of her being asleep when the accident happened, the evacuation had gone smoothly. The first-class passenger, Mr. Ferguson, was among the last men to leave the ship. He found himself in the boat with the engine crew and Captain Apfeld. Captain Apfeld was later said to have had 35 years of savings on board the ship in the form of specie, but he refused to leave the bridge to go get it while there were other passengers still on board. And by the time the last ship was ready to launch, the water was too high to reach it. Just as all the passengers, Captain Apfeld was leaving the ship with only the clothing on his back. They could not leave the ship quite yet, though. As the last boat pulled away, two men shouted to them from the sinking Vossland. They were two members of the crew who had somehow managed to sleep through not only the collision, but also the subsequent evacuation. They had only been awakened when seawater flooded their bunks through the portholes and had naturally realized that something had gone terribly wrong. The final lifeboat returned and pulled them off before continuing towards the Harmonides. It would take some of the boats two hours of miserable rowing and drifting to finally find the Harmonides. But once they did, they were met with kindness and hospitality from Captain Penton and his crew. The bow of the Harmonides was badly damaged, her bow plates were torn and twisted, and she had a huge rend in her port side, but she was still able to stay above water. Once all the people from the Vossland were on board, she met with a pilot boat off of Anglesey, and the pilot boat rushed to tell those on shore what had happened. Tugboats were quickly dispatched to escort her into port, just in case. Here, the passengers from the Vossland were landed and told that they would be able to complete their voyage the next Wednesday on another Red Star Line ship, the Nordland. A few of the passengers were battered and bruised, but all of them seemed to have been willing to continue their voyage. The courts would eventually find that the Harmonides was entirely to blame for the accident due to not stopping in the fog to ensure that there was no chance of collision with the Vossland. Captain Apfeld was declared to be entirely blameless, and he and his crew were praised again and again for how well they had handled the evacuation of the ship. The courts added 
that Captain Apfeld did not speak for himself, but they could tell by everyone being evacuated in such a short amount of time that Captain Apfeld should be credited with the incredible discipline of his crew. Captain Opfeld would go on to have an illustrious and decorated career. After the story of the Vaseland was known, he was honored by both King Leopold of Belgium and King Edward of the Seventh of the United Kingdom for his bravery. He was the captain of the Nordland in 1903, when smoke was spotted leaking from the forward hatch while the ship was a thousand miles from land. Worse, the cargo of the ship was hundreds of tons of wax, paraffin, and oil. Lifting the hatch, there was a burst of flames and smoke. The crew was already preparing to abandon ship, but Captain Upfeld instead grabbed a hose and, leading the crew himself down into the hold, they managed to fight against the fire before it could reach the oil. The fog that he lost the Vossland in clearly had an impact on Captain Upfeld, though whether or not any blame was attached to him. A story in 1904 reported that, as the captain of the Friesland, he had refused to sleep for four days when a heavy fog bank had set in, insisting that it was his duty to see them through it. Though his crew had tried to insist that they were able to keep watch and that he should rest, Captain Opfeld simply drank more coffee and said that while he had confidence in his crew, he was doing his duty as a captain. He had only sought his bed when the sun had finally shone through the fog. His crew might have protested, but his passengers only expressed their gratitude and spoke of the comfort that it had given them to see him on the bridge until they were all safe. For more information, please see Atlantic Liner, Suncoff Coast of Anglesey, from the 7th of March 1902 in the Evening Express, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.